miles south of Sydney is Botany Bay, scene of Captain James Cook's first anchorage on that historic day in the year 1770. Today, nearly 200 years later, and close to the landing place of its famous namesake, the handsome Captain Cook Bridge proudly spans the Georges River at its entrance to the bay. With the rapid expansion of population south of the Georges River in Botany Bay, the new bridge was necessary to relieve traffic congestion, for the nearby Tom Ugly's Bridge could not cope with the growing traffic loads. The site selected for the new bridge was almost a mile downstream, where a vehicular ferry running between San Susi and Tarrant Point was operating to the limit of its capacity. The bridge is a link in the future expressway which will connect the city of Sydney with the expanding industrial areas to the south at Wollongong and Port Kembla. The Captain Cook Bridge has an overall length of 1,662 feet and is made up of seven spans ranging in length from 185 feet to 250 feet. The six piers carrying the spans are supported on piles driven through the riverbed and the underlying sand and mud down to the solid sandstone at depths from 60 feet to 220 feet below water level. The driven piles used are unique in Australian bridge construction consisting of a pre-stressed concrete upper section and an H-shaped rolled steel lower section. To avoid corrosion of the steel, the concrete section extends in each case to a minimum of 25 feet below the riverbed. Work began in 1962 with the driving of the piles. The steel lower portion is first lifted into the driving rig and driven down. Each pre-stressed concrete pile contains an embedded steel section, so enabling the two portions to be welded before driving is continued. For driving the piles down through the riverbed, a large steam hammer was installed, delivering 37,000 foot-pounds of energy at each blow at the rate of 60 blows to the minute. As many as 80,000 blows were needed to drive the longest piles to the required depth. To test its capacity, a load of 280 tonnes, twice the designed load, was placed on the head of the pile. The most northerly pier was founded on cylindrical piles three feet in diameter. Excavation ten feet into rock was carried out inside steel cylinders driven to the rock. The cylinders are then cleaned out and filled with crushed basalt. Cement grout is mixed on shore and pumped by line to the piles where it's forced under pressure through the basalt to form concrete. The tops of the piles are encased in large caps of reinforced concrete. Anchorages are provided for securing the pier columns to the pile caps. For the concrete pouring of the pile caps, the concrete is delivered by floating crane. The concrete is then compacted by pneumatic vibrators. The strong tidal characteristics of the Georges River made completion of the pouring of concrete in the pile caps a matter of considerable urgency. Work continues on into the night under floodlight until the pile caps are ready to receive the pier columns.
it should be particularly noted that in line with modern trends in construction, the concrete used in the Captain Cook Bridge was predominantly in the form of pre-cast units, manufactured away from the bridge site. The blocks forming the pier columns were pre-cast at Penrith. A typical pier column block measures 11 feet in length with a height of 4 feet 5 inches. Widths vary from 7 feet 1 inch to 4 feet 6 inches. All blocks have a wall thickness of 9 inches, the average weight of each block being 7.5 tons. As each pier column block is delivered to the bridge site, it's transferred to a barge and towed out to the scene of operations. The attachment of a steel frame enables the floating crane to lift each block securely and accurately for final positioning in the pier column. bridge construction develops, the car ferry between San Susi and Tarrant Point continues to ply back and forth past the bridge site. As each column of blocks is completed, the blocks are anchored to one another by the insertion of eight high tensile steel bars, two positioned vertically inside each corner. To secure the bars, jacking equipment is employed, a force of 42 tons being applied to each bar and the holding down nut screwed home, the force being indicated on a pressure gauge. Careful measurement is taken of the extension of the bars as a check on the load. For the construction of the beams that will span between the piers, steel force work is assembled on barges and towed out into the stream, where it's maneuvered by winches and jacks and by the aid of tidal action, into position, ready to receive the beam blocks. Each beam consists of hollow, reinforced concrete blocks. At the end of each span, special end blocks are provided. The first block in the beam mates over the last block of the previous beam. A steel roller bearing is later inserted in the horizontal gap. By January 1964, almost a third of the beams are in position. As already mentioned, the predominance of precast concrete is a feature of the Captain Cook Bridge, and all the beam blocks were precast at Regent's Park outside Sydney. In the case of the end blocks, anchorages are provided for the high tensile steel cables which will bind the blocks together, and stoutly reinforced to resist the large forces to be encountered. In the preparation of the mould, ducts are provided to receive the cables. Plate-like diaphragms are precast for incorporation at regular intervals along the beams.
thus connecting the four beams transversely. Continuous supervision was maintained by the Department of Main Roads at all yards engaged on the pre-casting of concrete units for the bridge. The dimensions of the beam blocks range in length from 7 feet 6 inches to 12 feet, in height from 8 feet to 12 feet, while their width is uniform at 11 feet. By July 1964, the construction work is well advanced and the graceful lines of the bridge have become evident. As the precast beam blocks arrive at the riverbank, they are placed onto a special tipping device which rotates them into the correct position for placing on the false work. With an average weight of 17 tons, this intermediate operation is essential for smooth handling. Delivery into position from the riverbank is effected in the same manner as used for the pier column blocks. By barge, across to the floating crane, to be placed on the false work with a three inch gap between each block. At last, the final beam block is lifted from the barge and lowered towards the false work. With careful maneuvering, the heavy block is swung into position for completion of the last beam. A final signal and the block is brought gently to rest. And so, all 736 blocks are in position. As the blocks are assembled on the false work, the three inch gaps between each are filled with high strength concrete, making the beams continuous from end to end. The filling of the gaps takes place concurrently outside and inside the beams. The beams are then stressed by the introduction of one and one eighth inch diameter high tensile steel cables fed through ducts in the end blocks and secured with steel wedges. Before any high tensile steel cables were used, samples were tested at the Department of Main Road's Central Testing Laboratory in a machine capable of exerting a pull of 200 tons. The elastic properties of the 1 and 1 8 inch cable were measured first, after which the delicate measuring device was removed and the cable loaded right up to breaking point. Results of testing were carefully plotted and the tensile properties of the sample evaluated. On the bridge site, jacking equipment applies the force to lock the beam blocks firmly and finally together. A force of 65 tons applied to each cable in turn. All readings are carefully recorded and checked to ensure that the correct force is applied.
To allow for expansion and contraction with changes of temperature, roller bearings of special armor plate steel are placed between mating surfaces of the special end beam blocks. One of the completed beams was test loaded in order to check its carrying capacity. The performance of the loaded beam was carefully recorded and studied. With the bridge nearing completion, embankments are brought up at each end to form the approach roads, and heavy equipment is used to move the earth and compact it thoroughly. The abutments at each end of the bridge are formed from reinforced concrete frames covered with concrete facing slabs. The deck of the abutment is supported on pre-stressed concrete girders 50 feet in length which were manufactured at Blacktown. For the girders, steel reinforcement and high tensile steel strands are assembled. Each of the strands is loaded to 11 tons with a hydraulic jack. The girders are then subjected to testing as a check on their capacity. Also at Blacktown, reinforced concrete slabs were produced to span between the beams of the bridge to carry the roadway. Prior to the pouring of deck concrete, steel reinforcement is placed between the precast deck slabs. As the work progresses, footways are formed on either side of the bridge by the attachment of precast concrete slabs to the outer girders. The method employed in installing the footway slabs is of particular interest. The slabs are first brought into position, brackets are then fitted over bolts fixed in the main beams, two brackets being welded to each slab. Tightening of the nuts on the bolts then allows for fine adjustment of the level of the slabs thereby eliminating all need of false work. With the deck ready to receive the concrete surface, mechanized barrows are brought into play to convey the concrete from the delivery trucks while a bonding solution is sprayed on. The concrete is thoroughly compacted with pneumatic vibrators and finally leveled off with a vibrating screed. As with all concrete in the bridge, the deck concrete was sampled for examination of consistency and strength, 
The measure of consistency is provided by observing the slump of a cone of concrete. For strength testing, the concrete is molded into cylinders 6 inches in diameter and 12 inches in length. After curing for 28 days in a fog room, each cylinder is capped with molten sulphur, giving it a precisely true surface. then placed in a testing machine capable of exerting a force of 200 tons and tested to destruction. The force required to crush the concrete cylinder is then recorded. Following completion of the deck, the carriageway curbs are formed up. The pouring of concrete into the curb forms provides the final encasement of the bolts holding the footway slabs in position, thereby permanently securing the footway. Meanwhile, concrete is brought to various points along the deck for delivery to the inside of the beams where the high tensile steel cables are being encased. The concrete is thoroughly compacted to seal the cables against salt air and dampness. Steel safety railings are erected along the outer edges of the footways and secured by bolts cast into the concrete. added protection, the handrails are coated with zinc, followed by two coats of Ferrador paint. Between footway and carriageway, a low concrete wall is erected and surmounted by a heavy tube railing forming a crash barrier. Overhead lighting is incorporated into the bridge structure by the provision of ducts in the concrete for the distribution of electric wiring. Steel plates with interlocking fingers are installed to cover the gaps between the ends of adjacent beams to permit expansion and contraction caused by temperature changes. Next, a median strip of concrete is placed on the deck to separate opposing streams of traffic. Before placing the roadway's asphalt surface layer, a tack coat of bitumen is sprayed onto the concrete deck. Asphalt, delivered to the site at a minimum temperature of 275 degrees Fahrenheit, is discharged onto the deck and applied evenly by means of a mechanical spreader, a smooth, impervious surface being obtained by thorough rolling. Finally, the Captain Cook Bridge is complete. In its construction, 
18,000 cubic yards of concrete have been used, together with 2,000 tons of steel reinforcement. On May the 29th, 1965, a large and enthusiastic crowd gathers to watch the opening ceremony. This is performed by the Governor of New South Wales, Sir Eric Woodward. ...of very far-reaching social and economic importance, the bridge is a real credit to everyone who had any hand in its building. Do you wonder then, ladies and gentlemen, that it will give me the very greatest pleasure to declare this Captain Cook Bridge open. A commemorative plaque is unveiled by the governor, who then formally opens the bridge. The official party leads the way over the newly opened bridge and the people eagerly throng the roadway to inspect their new possession while the Tarrant Point car ferry passes alongside the structure that now replaces it after 49 years of faithful service. And so the Captain Cook Bridge, named after the intrepid Englishman who sailed into Australian waters nearly 200 years earlier, now stands as a bold symbol of the nation's progress. Its smooth classical lines stem from a design advanced by world standards, and it is aesthetically satisfying as well as being entirely functional. Built for the Department of Main Roads, New South Wales, by John Holland Constructions Proprietary Limited at an overall cost of three and a quarter million dollars, the fulfillment of its role as part of the Southern Expressway has yet to come. But motorists, meanwhile, welcome its contribution to the relief of traffic congestion and to the improvement of safe driving conditions. <laughs>